Colin, one of the reasons I went into uh, brain science is I, I hope to understand the mind and what it is. And is there something different about the mind? Is there some non-physical element? Uh, of course, all the work I did had, you know, didn't, didn't find anything <laughs> like that, uh, obviously. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a perennial question. And as philosophers deal with brain and mind, uh, this, is, this is a question of, of what constitutes the mind. And we know the brain is necessary. Nobody denies that, I don't think. Uh, but the question is, is the brain sufficient? And what does that mean? Yeah. The problem here is it's chalk and cheese. I mean, I know what a brain is. Uh, you know, it's a physical thing. I know what it looks like, what it contains. I can see sections on the microscope and so on. I also have this other word, mind, and we all know what that means, too, in a way. We can talk to each other about it. But... You can't put it under a microscope. Uh, we don't know what constitutes exactly. We don't know where, what its genetics are. Or it, you know, it's a word which is useful in dialogue, but doesn't map onto something you can study easily right. experimentally. Right. So one thing that neuroscientists have tended to do, actually, uh, is simply to put the concept to right. one side. Say, you know, sure. It's not the mind we're working on, it's the brain right. we work on. How much of an animal's behavior can we explain just by studying some brains? And, and you can get a long way. Very long way. Yeah, the question is whether you can get all the way. Yeah, and the and yeah, so the issue of minds and particularly consciousness, which seems to most people's thinking to be an essential feature of how our minds work, has e has emerged more of a current topic, particularly with the development of these brain imaging mm -hmm. techniques to look at what's going on mm -hmm. inside uh, normal and abnormal um, brains. It's a sort of legitimate question, actually partly made legitimate by Francis Crick, you know, the discoverer of the structure sure, of sure, DNA, sure. with um, with a book in which he said, "You know, now is the time to start um, studying right, consciousness, right. laying down the challenge to neuroscience. Mm -hmm. One day, neuroscience has to explain mm -hmm. minds and consciousness mm -hmm. in the same way that it, ex it explains the control of movement or seeing the world." Right, right. Right. Okay. So, uh, what are some of the steps that we can we can use to try to uh, try to go from brain to a full explanation of uh, of behaviors? Yeah, it's awfully difficult because there is this this question of the private nature of mentation. Of the first person, the, as we say, the, what it feels like. Exactly. What it feels like. The subjectivity of experience which you just can't nail down exactly. You can't put an electrode into it. You can't see it through the microscope. So how do you couple some recordable representation of mental experiences with things that you can measure that are going on inside the head? What Crick would have called the, the neural correlate of consciousness. Mm -hmm. If we start with the assumption that mental states, conscious states, are generated by brain states, they map onto brain states, then we should be able to find for each change in mental state a corresponding change in brain state. Mm. One approach to this, and, I, and I've done some work in this area myself, is looking in circumstances where perception, perceptual interpretation, conscious subjective interpretation, let's say of a visual scene, changes, even though the physics of the visual scene does not change. Uh, for instance, in uh, ambiguous figures, well-known mm -hmm, ambiguous mm -hmm. figures, you like, for instance, that famous vase, vase. face illusion. Right, you know, right. Is it two profile faces or right. is it a vase? Right. You look at it and it flips between the two. Physically, the image is the same all the time. Mm. Something's happening in your head, you're mm. reinterpreting it. Um, and I and colleagues did an experiment in which we looked at brain activity while that's happening and showed that if you just focus on the area of the brain that's thought to be involved in recognizing faces, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can predict whether the person is seeing the thing as a pair of faces mm. or as a vase mm. by changes in the activity of that mm. area, with a reliability of about 80% or, or so. That's strong. That's so very there good. you're seeing a correlate, an activity which is correlated with an internally generated mm -hmm. change of mind. I think the philosophers would think this is a pretty primitive and trivial demonstration of a relationship between brain and uh, mind, but it's a beginning. They would say the difference between a, a correlation and causation. Yes. And well, if you're, so, you're showing correlation, you're not showing causation. And then they use this thought of experiment of, of a zombie. A zombie is a person who looks exactly like me, does the same things, reacts the same, is as smart or as dumb as I am, 
but has no inner experience. Yes. It's, it's more of a robotic That touches reaction. on, the, of course, this cr the crucial question of whether consciousness has a functional role in yes. our lives. Yes. Pretty scary to think that it might not, but, but, the, but the zombie, you're quite right, the zombie argument heightens that question by mm -hmm. saying, can you imagine that someone who didn't right. have a subjective world, would was not aware, right. would be able to do all the things? Well, right. well, what kinds of things can we do that we could not do without being aware of what we're doing. I don't think there's anything we could not do. The question is, can we do it much better with the, the, the consciousness? Well, that, and that I would say, I'd go beyond that and say that if we could do it better, then how is being conscious adding yes. to the process? Because if you accept the fundamental argument that all of the features of consciousness are, are the result of brain states, then everything that consciousness can do is represented by something that the brain is doing. Mm -hmm. So how can the consciousness add more? <laughs> how can you add more? Where's the more coming from? Mm, 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 mm. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And, and, and if, it, if it did add more, how is the consciousness, whatever it is, because we're all talking now just words, in a sense meaningless words, we don't know what they mean. But how well, could we, being... We, we do know what it We do know what it feels like. And I know what I feel like. Mm. I, I, I think I know what you feel like, but I can never be sure, no. obviously. But well, we don't know how it works. We don't we know how it works. does. But can we imagine that this state of being aware is somehow able to act downwards yes. on our brains right. and change the physical stru right, structure right, right, of our brains. Right. For instance, when you make a moral decision, should I do that? Should I pick up that coin I've seen that someone's left behind or yeah. give it back to them? Right. Is there something magical which is happening downwards on our right, brain right, to make right, us right, do the right, right thing? Right, I don't right, think so. Right. So here's the argument of some, that they say that, sure, consciousness is produced by lower activities in the brain kind of working together, a, a bottoms-up kind of activity of causation, causing an emergent consciousness, whatever that may mean. And then, and here's the point, the emergent consciousness, top-down causation, causes changes in the brain. Yeah, but that would require consciousness, whatever it is, this subjective state to go back and act on the physical machinery yes, yes. of the brain. I mean, you know, it's conceivable, but I don't see any evidence of it, and I don't think it's a good starting hypothesis. I mean, how would it happen? We know about neurons. We know about, you know, ions crossing membranes, impulses traveling around, chemicals being produced, producing movement. Where does the consciousness come in? This is, this is dualism. Yeah. This is back to Descartes. Right? Right. Well, I mean, there are people who say this who claim they're not dualists. Now, I find that difficult, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, because believe. they say that the, 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 there's an emergent uh, a combination of brain. They don't, then, then they add nothing spooky. I mean, the people who bring in souls yeah. at least has a consistency. There's no soul in this, so it's the, 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 the bottoms-up electrical activities causes some top-level top, top electrical activities, yes. which then is an emergent phenomenon of some well, okay, kind. And we, then we, we know that brains can work top-down as well as bottom-up. But, uh, um, for instance, um, you know, if you imagine a visual scene, imagine a face, close your eyes, imagine mm -hmm. a face, mm -hmm. Somehow your brain turns on areas of your visual cortex which respond yeah. to faces yeah, yeah, yeah. top down. Right, and right, you right. can you can determine your own attention, for instance, right, a different right. thing top down. Right. None of that refers to consciousness. Mm, mm. And none of it certainly refers to conscious processes outside the brain right. acting back onto the brain. Right. So the, the brain has bottom-up, top-down activity within it, but it's all within networks of neurons mm. without referring to consciousness at all. Somehow the process creates consciousness. I, I think epiphenomena, to some philosophers it's a dirty word, is not a bad way of starting well, to think it, about the If process. it is that, you should call it what it is. Yeah. As somebody I, once put it, the, the whistle of the steam engine, n not the steam. Yeah. Or let's say the color of a brain. Brains are a kind of funny gray color. They could be any color. They still work. <laughs> right. Maybe consciousness is like that. Mm. Okay. Uh, philosophers have another approach called extended mind, in which they say that the real mind is in, in, in not a metaphoric way, but some literal way outside the body, mm -hmm. in, in my diary where I have mem memory, or in my computer, or in the, my social relationships, that that's yeah, yeah. really part, not some metaphoric yeah, yeah. or help, but, but is really part of, of my mind. Well, it depends on you know, what you think that mind is. If you think mind is the capacity of brains to, you know, to act, to, to, to they are an ex it's an expression of the way in which brains act on the world. One of the ways, the most important ways that humans act on the world is acting between each other, sharing facts mm -hmm. through language, developing common knowledge, 
within their brains, capturing knowledge acquired through language or through reading. I, it's not unreasonable to call that a, a distributed mind. I used the phrase collective mm -hmm. mind in the mm -hmm. 1970s to describe that. There's nothing magical, mm -hmm. nothing ethereal, nothing spiritual. It is the combined action of lots of brains working mm -hmm. together using the vehicle of language to communicate facts from one person to another, to change each other's brains. Mm -hmm. So all in, are brains and mind the same thing? Uh, they, you know, there's, a, there's a catchphrase that, that minds are what brains do. Um, or, and although philosophically that doesn't stand up to detailed exam, that's a good starting point, I think. Set aside our folk psychological views of what minds are, maybe we need other sorts of words to describe higher level functions of organizations within, within brains, rather than dwelling on this mm. concept, pre-scientific concept of how our brains work.